Okay. <laughs> okay. Hi. Uh, thank you for coming to, to this lecture. Uh, my name is Yuki Okumura. You can yeah, read it here. I'm from Japan. And uh, I just, last month I, I started <laughs> Uh, my role here as a PhD researcher. So this lecture is kind of part of my project. And uh, today, uh, I basically want to, well, yeah, the title of the, the lecture is Between Action and Intuition, Conceptual Art Through the Philosophy of Kitaro Nishida. And today, basically I want to talk about two things. One is like, what is conceptual art? Um, like I will, present it through the words of artist Solwit and also through uh, some of the works by the, some of the representative artists. And then I want to talk about um, the, e the effect, twin effect of conceptual art to, to the world and to the self um, through the philosophy of a Japanese philosopher called Kitaro Nishida. Um, yeah, so through like this philosophical angle, um, kind of provided by his ideas, and then after that, I hope to kind of suggest some kind of um, vision or future. I don't know hidden potentiality of conceptual art. Right. So I will just begin now. So conceptual art uh, is historical thing. It's like a historical category of art. Um, basically, like, actively practiced in, in the 60s and 70s, like, around from, from 66 to 75. Um, so, by conceptual art, I don't mean art, art today. I don't mean art works that have conceptual, conceptual aspects today. But I mean this art, uh, it was, which was active in the 60s, 60s and 70s. Um, like things like this, works like this, like most of them have like, um, they are not like paintings or sculptures, but more like documents, diagrams, photographs, text, numbers, uh, those mediums that convey information. <laughs> Um, and they normally look very, oh, sorry, it's not loaded, but normally look very dry and kind of impersonal, non-emotional. Um, the, yeah. Oh, I forgot to introduce myself. Yeah, because I, I yeah, the, the, the first page I missed. Maybe I, be, <laughs> should I go back? <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, yeah, I go back? Okay. Uh, <laughs> my name is Yuki Okumura, and I'm an artist, and I'm also a translator between Eng English and Japanese. And uh, for me, translation is something, um, a way to go beyond your own individuality, kind of like a, a way to become someone else through uh, personal pronouns. For example, as a translator, if, uh, if someone writes like, hey, I'm, I'm from Antwerp, and I need to translate this into Japanese, I need to write, I am from Antwerp in Japanese. So I need to repeat the pronoun, uh, personal pronoun. That, uh, and, um, even though I'm not, uh, I'm not from Antwerp, I need to say I am from Antwerp. So through this, just simply, you kind of, you take the position of this person. Um, so, like, in a way, the difference between self and other is kind of broad through translation. But at the same time, um, through translation, for me, translation is also a way to portray who I am. So it's like a self-portrait. Because um, the more you try to, because when you translate, you need to follow the original writing or original speaking. So you need, you need to uh, reduce your own personality. You need to, like, a, basically you need to become a machine. You want to become a machine. Um, but, you, but you cannot become a machine because you are a human. But 
but uh, the more you try to be a uh, machine, the more your uh, essential, my, is my voice too loud? Too loud? Okay. <laughs> your essential core kind of uh, is revealed because let's say you are not who you think you are. You are your body. You are a holistic being as a body and when you try to um, reduce your personality, then the, uh, what you are, what your body is, appears <laughs> more. Um, but this is actually an idea also kind of referring to the Japanese philosopher. But anyway, I've been thinking like this way. So for me, translation is a way to also, uh, it's a way to become someone else, but at the same, at the same time, to, it's a way to portray who you are. So it's kind of twin, totally contradictory effects. And my artwork has been the same thing. For me, my, my work has been a translation as well. Um, concretely speaking, I've been mostly working with or working on another artist. And each time I um, kind of, I, well, my work has been always dealing with the overlaps between me and this artist, or also gaps between me and this artist. And through this, I try to um, find a new way of uh, define, defining individuality. Normally, your individuality is defined by your body, your body, body separation, but I was more, I've been more uh, interested in uh, individuate uh, through like overlaps across different personalities. Maybe, well, I don't know. I mean, I can't explain further much. And I've been working with like, on, I've been working on different artists, such as On Kawara, the Japanese artist, another Japanese artist, Hisachika Takahashi, who, uh, who had a exhibition at Wide White Space, a gallery in Antwerp in the 60s. Um, or Stanley Brown, uh, Golda Matta Clark, different artists. For example, uh, in 2017, I made a film called Welcome Back, Golden Matt Clark. Yeah. And here, do you know Golden Matt Clark, the American artist? Yeah. Um, my idea was that I might be his reincarnation because. Uh, not only because I was born in the year in which he died, but also because um, he had a brother, he had a twin brother, elder brother, who committed suicide by jumping, and I also had a brother, uh, elder, uh, who committed suicide by jumping. So I thought, oh, uh, we have something in common, and uh, I felt some connection with him. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I am his reincarnation. Then, um, so I went to meet this guy, his name is Floor Bex. He's a Flemish curator um, in Antwerp four years ago. And uh, I, asked, I asked him, what, can you tell me what happened to my work after I died? I mean, it's great to meet you again. You know, it's great to re reunite with you. And could you tell me what happened to my work after I died? Because maybe it's, it's famous, so maybe you might know, but uh, the museum, Mukka, museum, mu mu museum of Contemporary Art, Antwerp, was uh, founded, established, uh, because of Gordon Matterclock, let's say. Um, so Gordon, as I say, his brother died in 1976, but he also died in 1978, uh, in which I was born, um, because of some cancer. And the, the year before he was in Antwerp, he made a huge project called Office Baroque. Um, at, at, along the river, what is the name of the river? Yeah, yeah. And near the castle, near this famous castle. So Gordon's work has been always uh, making cut, cuts and holes inside and outside of a building to be demolished, before being demolished. He had a, you know, freedom to do cuts. And so here in Antwerp, he did the same thing. Although, the auto, well, although it was only uh, allowed to cut inside. But anyway, then he died and his work was left. Uh, I, I didn't have to talk about this for such a long time, but 
Um, so, um, Frobex, the guy, he wanted to keep the building because uh, all the other pieces by Gordon have, had been demolished already. So it was the only piece that still existed in the world. So he wanted to keep it. But he asked many artists around the world to donate their work to do, to do an auction and to get money to preserve the building. But before, uh, the, before the auction could happen, the real estate company demolished the building without telling them. So they, they couldn't preserve the building, but they, they had already lots of works from different artists. So they built a museum with these works as the founding collection. That is a, that is a, that, that is a story, and Gordon himself didn't know this because he was dead already. And that's why I went to meet him, to ask him, yeah, what happened? And he, then he begins to narrate the, the entire story, and also he begins to talk about his friendship with Gordon, with me. Um, and yeah, lots of different things. Uh, also brotherhood, um, what art is, things like that. But anyway, in here, in here, in this film, I use I, as Gordon. I, when I say I, it means Gordon. And when he says you, it also means Gordon. <laughs> so it's just a very simple kind of play with personal pronouns, you know, as I said. So it's like a kind of like an expansion of what translation is for me. Um, and so I've been doing different projects. And in the end, recently, I reached conceptual art. these things, um, because I found, I found that conceptual art has something similar to uh, translation. Um, for me, translation is a way to become someone else and also to, to portray who I am. And I thought oh, conceptual art itself has the same, uh, same um, I don't know, effect or something. Concept chart is a methodology, and in this methodology, this uh, mechanism is already embedded, I found out. So I thought, oh, I, now I don't want to work on one artist. I mean, you know, until now I've been each time working with one artist, but now, okay, I wanna work on this entire category of conceptual art, which means actually around 50 artists at, at one time. Um, yeah, that was the beginning of my research for my PhD. Yeah, this is what I wanted to tell you. <laughs> and now let's go back or go forward. Yes, so conceptual art, it's famous, right? And people think, many people think, this is the representative work of conceptual art by Joseph Kossuth called One and Three Chairs. And so a real chair and a photo of the chair and the dictionary definition of the chair, of a chair. Three things, but maybe one thing. Um, and in his own text by uh, Joseph Kossuth in, uh, in 1970, published in 1970 called, no, 1969, I think, 1969, called Art, and, Art, Art After Philosophy. And also in his text published in 1970, uh, he says, I mean, Kossuth, this artist says, uh, conceptual art, a work of conceptual art is a presentation of the artist's intention. And conceptual art is about the concept called art. It's about art. And in conceptual art, the idea is the work, not, the, not, this, not this object, but the idea um, behind the work, behind the object. It's that work itself. That's what he said. And his, he kind of, he be, well, how to say, his work or his ideas uh, became influential and popular because one reason is because he says he made this piece, this chair, uh, in 1965, which is very, very early. Um, and, and his piece and his idea that the idea is the work was 
had a, um, a prox proximity, it was kind of affinity with uh, something, the idea called dematerialization. So conceptual art had also in 1968, uh, the critic Lucy Lippard said, recently work, artworks have been dematerialized. Now, not so much object, object, but just some least objects that contain information, that just to convey information, as I said. So she said, oh, this is dematerialization. And people thought, okay, this is the definition of conceptual art. And that piece by Sol, uh, uh, Joseph Kosuth and his idea had something very, very um, in line with this. Because for him, the idea is a work. So the idea is not material. It's dematerialized already. It's immaterial. So, so uh, normally, people think conceptual art is dematerialized. And conceptual art is art of concept, and art of the artist's intention. But I don't, uh, I don't accept this view. I don't like it, because um, Kosu said he made this piece in 1965, but actually he didn't do it. He only conceived it. He claimed, oh, I conceived the idea in 1965. But actually, he uh, only talked about it in 1969 and physicalized it in 1970. But because of his claim, uh, all the museums now, like MoMA, they, they accepted his um, claim. And they say it's 1965, but I believe he lied because he wanted to be the first conceptual artist. And also, um, I mean, not just me, but some uh, critics like Benjamin Buclo, and they also doubted him. And a lot of artists at that time um, complained. And, uh, and another reason, more, I think a more important, important reason is that conceptual art, this term was uh, invented, coined by one artist called Sol Luit. Wait, do I have it here? Oh, yeah. In this text called Paragraphs on Conceptual Art, 1967, 1967. So the term conceptual art is not the invention of uh, Joseph Kostus, but Sol Luit. And in this text, he defined it very clearly. So I want to explain his idea. This is him, uh, born in 1928 in New York, no, in Connecticut. And uh, mm, he was making kind of abstract and geometric paintings and then sculptures. And in 1966, uh, uh, yeah. So this is a, his piece from 1966. And uh, he was using modules what he calls. So meaning, I think, like units of same form. Uh, the same form, but different units. And you combine it to build a structure. That was his, uh, that was his uh, methodology. And however, his work was included in an exhibition called Primary Structures in 1966, in the same year. And all the works in this show, after that, would be uh, categorized as so-called minimal art. So his work was included in this category, minimal art. Then he was not happy, because for him, uh, the minimal appearance was just a result of the methodology. What, what is important for him was more like just to, uh, uh, to process. Um, yeah, I will explain this now. Um, so he wrote a text to differentiate distinguish his, uh, his, his uh, work and also some works by, uh, by similar artists. Yeah. And he said, my work is not minimal, it's serial. Oh, no, not this one, sorry. Yeah, maybe too small, but so let me explain like, what, what, what he means by serial. Uh, so this is one of his pieces then called Serial, serial Project. And you have like one square and another square, basically two squares. 
and you make the middle one to a cube or the, the out, outer one to a cube. Or you make both of them as cubes. Or, and then you extend the, 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 the central one to the same height of the outer cube. So like all the permutations of this, am I making sense? Yes. <laughs> so this is a skeleton, but uh, this, oh, yeah. And this one, like a, uh, the inner, inner cube has walls, planes. Oh, yeah. And this one, uh, only the outside have planes. So there are three versions. Yeah, and so he wrote a text called, yeah, 3L project. And here he explains what what serial artist and what a serial artist does. So he writes about his ideas and also like showed some illustrations. So here, he, I mean he means serial artist. A serial artist would follow his predetermined premise to its conclusion, avoiding subjectivity. This means like you, you define rules, premise in the beginning, like just like I, I just explained. Yeah, you have two, two squares and you, know, you have permutation and stuff like that. And you just follow this rule to the end. You don't change your mind and you just follow it. And by following it, you kind of avoid subjectivity because you don't have any subjective judgments you don't make different, you don't make any changes to, yeah, to its conclusion. And the serial artist does not attempt to produ produce a beautiful or mysteri mysterious object, but functions merely as a clerk cataloging the results of his premise. Yeah, um, so traditionally artists produce a beautiful or mysterious object and the artists function as artists, like you have great sensibility and also great craftsmanship, you have skills. So you can do things that no, other people cannot do. That was the artist. But serial artist, serial artist is not, not like that. Serial artist is like a clerk who works like adm administratively. You just do things and you collect the results catalogs the results. That's what he said. Um, yeah, actually the, the photo I just showed were, photos I showed were models of the work, this work, just small models, but this is how he physicalized it. Oh yeah. And after this, it was like 1966, I think in May or something. And then in 1967, he changed uh, serial art, evolved into conceptual art. He, ch he made it kind of uh, broader. Because for, I mean, serial art was only appropriate for artists working in that uh, methodology, like you make permutations, you have rules and you, you just realize all the possible outcomes, like calculation, computing. Um, but uh, he, he kind of, uh, he deleted this, this condition, but he left the other things intact. And that was, that was uh, so serial art was revised into conceptual art. Now he calls it conceptual art, so that uh, it would be appropriate also for other artists, uh, broader artists. That's the text I showed, this uh, paragraph on conceptual art. So in this text he says, I will 
I will refer to the kind of art in which I am involved as conceptual art. So here he names it. Before that, there was no conceptual art. There was concept art or some similar namings, but no conceptual art. And then he says, it is the process of conception and realization with which the artist is concerned. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, so he was not happy with the, uh, the uh, categorization of minimal art because it was only about the result. He was more in, into the process. So here, he's saying the same thing. It's, it's the process with which the artist is concerned, not, not the result. And if the artist wishes to explore his idea thoroughly, uh, arbitrary or chance decisions would be uh, eliminated from the making of the art. Again, the same thing. It's, he's talking about avoiding subjectivity. So you just put rules and you follow it, and when you uh, follow the rules, you, you make no... <laughs> No um, changes, no arbitrary changes. You just follow it as a machine, like a translator. You, you try to be a machine. And, uh, uh, yeah, so he's saying the same thing. To work with a plan that is preset is one way of avoiding subjectivity. Um, but throughout the text, she defines conceptual art, conceptual art as a method methodology uh, to avoid subjectivity, to work on something you predetermined. And the most important thing for this lecture is here. Ideas are discovered by intuition. Um, so it's not like intellect. Uh, it's not, um, how to say, logical thinking to find the idea of the work. You, you just intuitively, you catch some idea. It comes from somewhere and you catch it. <laughs> and then you don't know why you want to do it, but you just get it and you believe it. You believe it. You don't uh, doubt it. Whatever it is, you just realize it as it is. This is the, what, is, what conceptual art is for him and uh, through my understanding. And two years later, he wrote another text called Sentences on Conceptual Art. It's like 35, um, how do you call it in English? I forgot, but yeah, I don't know. 35 conditions, like you follow it, and then you can become a conceptual artist or something like that. Um, but uh, so I want to kind of, how to say, we have no time here, so I analyzed those two texts and uh, interpret, interpreted his ideas into a chart what is it? Um, of like, yeah, how to make a concept chart. I mean, how the processes, uh, the typical, yeah, typical process of making a concept chart, making a work of conceptual art. Um, and uh, I want to explain this with a work by American artist, another American artist, Douglas Hubera, because his work is very, very um, representative in, for this. So it begins with uh, conception. Conception. A simple idea is conceived intuitively in the mind of the concipient. So that, uh, as I just said, um, so it's like, oh, it's like when you meet a friend and you ask him, you ask her or him, like, do you have any idea of, like, of what to do tonight? Like, things like that. And you go, oh, maybe let's go out for this bar. <laughs> this kind of like very simple, um, how to say. I mean, idea for Solwit is a plan to do something, plan of actions. It's not meaning or it's not principle, but it's uh, just a plan to do something. It's the idea for him. And, and he, uh, for this, he also says, I mean, yeah, in here, 
Conceptual artists are mystics rather than rationalists. This is you know, the same thing. And then, and also there's a, diff a, a huge difference between him and Joseph Kosus, the chair artist, because he said for him, a, a work of conceptual art for, for him was a presentation of his intention. Um, yeah, but I will talk about it later. Uh, and then after conception, there's instruction. The conceived idea is converted by the concipient to a set of rules for simple actions. Um, oh yeah, I forgot to show you Hubra. So this is Douglas Hubra, born in 1924. And in 1968, he kind of became conceptualized. He became a conceptual artist, let's say, with this piece. Um, before that, he was making uh, a bit like Louis. He was making like, uh, yeah, those geometric sculptures. Oh. But then he thought, oh, maybe not sculptures, but uh, I want to put the geometric form on, how to say, onto a map. Now, not like this sculpture, but he wants to create a huge sculpture um, over a map. So maybe that was the idea he conceived. And then from this idea, he made a rule. He made, he made a set of rules. He made instructions by converting the idea. Um, like, OK, let's put, uh, oh, what's the English term for this form? Hexagon, yes. <laughs> Two hexagons, one in Boston, one over Boston, one over New York. Let's put the hexagon, and let's go to the, uh, each location, each vertex, you say. Um, let's go there and take a photo. That was his instruction to himself. Then, uh, realization. The, instru the instructed actions are carried out by the executant by following the instructions absolutely, blindly, and mechanically. Um, so, in general, in conceptual art, uh, everyone, anybody could carry out the process. So it says executant here. But in many, most cases, the artist himself, herself, that does it because no one else would be interested. I mean, it's very easy, you can do it, but it's just boring, so no one wants to do it, let's say. And I, I think it's the important thing is that uh, mm, the actions featured in conceptual art are things that anybody could do, I just said, as, as I just said. Um, in traditional art, you, need, you have to have uh, great sensibility and great skills, but for conceptual art, you don't need them. You just need to be a human. Uh, hopefully, like able-bodied, like you have, you know, you have no defunct as a body. And then you can do it. Simple things. And for Douglas Hubra, just, so he followed the rules he set to himself. So he just went to each location, take photos. And after that, there's manifestation. The realized actions are presented through documentations in the most succinct, <laughs> uh, effective way. No, it's like it's minimally necessary. Like, I don't know, succinct, succinct. Just you don't, how to say, you don't decorate the work. You just show it as just to convey the information uh, neutrally, you try. And for Hubra, it was a publication. So for, to present this work, he didn't do a physical exhibition, but he did an exhibition on the publication because a book was the most effective medium for him to convey all the information, uh, the photos and the rules and the diagrams and the maps.
And after manifestation, there's perception. Perception meaning like uh, the viewer perceive the work. Um, percep perceiving the manifested documentation, the actual event is re reconstructed subjectively in the mind of the percipient. In some cases, the percipient is, is inspired by the perceptual experience to conceive a new idea. So for, so for solid uh, uh, conceptual art is like a cycle. You know, you, sh you make, you do something, you show it, and you, you inspire some, uh, someone else. And this person uh, conceives a new idea. So this, like, it's a circle or spiral chart. Um, So maybe, maybe um, uh, I just introduced some other pieces by some other artists that are conceptual in this sense. Like Lawrence Weiner. like this. Um, hmm. So this work is called Two Minutes of Spray Paint Directly Upon the Floor from a Standard Elzar Khan. So he just did it. Um, yeah. And also this one. Um, like 36 inch by 36 inch removal uh, from the wall. And he just did it. But uh, for Lawrence, Lawrence Wiener, uh, like uh, um, he said, his work doesn't have to be built. Or it could be, could be built by himself or could be built by anyone else. Um, but in, in the, I mean, so, in, well, Essentially, his work is just a text, just a text in a book or just on the wall or things like that. Um, but uh, as you said, as you, as you saw, in early stages, he himself was often realizing it. And yeah, let's move to another artist, On Kawara, the Japanese artist. He, like in 1966, he began uh, something that is called uh, date painting, two-day series. So he just painted the date of the very day on the canvas. And he, I think, continued this almost for five decades until he passed away to, in 2014. But he was making this until 2013. And uh, famously, like, he never presented himself to the public. So kind of basically people, doesn't, people don't know who, how he looks like. And that is part of his practice. And in 1968, oh, no, not this one. Um, OK, he began also a series of postcards uh, to, to inform his friends of the time he get up, he has got up on that day. I think he did this for well, 10 years or something like that. And in 1970, he began a, a series of uh, telegrams that says, I am still alive, also sent to his friends. And I think these works all, all kind of uh, follow the definition, the chart I just presented. <laughs> so what is conceptual art? My, my interpretation of Solowitz's definition. It's uh, conceptual art is art where the original conception Intuition is acted out without deviation throughout the execution process. Yes, so if the work is made this way, it's conceptual. In the sense of uh, initial definition by Solwit.
This also means that um, conceptual art is believed as the, the materialization of the art object, as I said, which the object is a form, it's a result of the process. But conceptual art is essentially not about the result, not, not about the form, but about the process. So if, um, it could be said that its conceptual, work of conceptual art is depersonalization of the artist during the process. Because you follow the preset rules, um, how to say, yeah, this, this action, this um, attitude to follow it blindly, uh, absolutely, itself is a way of depersonalize, depersonalizing yourself, I think, because you, need, you don't need your personality, you just need to be a human body. And, uh, and also, as I said, each process is very, very easy for anyone to carry out. This, this, this means you literally uh, render yourself as anybody. Like, you are, some, some, you, you are somebody, but uh, in doing a piece of conceptual art, you need to become anybody. Um, Am I making sense? sense? I hope so. This also means that the true medium of conceptual art is performance, opposed to theater, because it's an action. And it's not, it's not just a normal action, but action in which you follow the predetermined rules. And, uh, you know, it's not theater. Theater, uh, etymologically, uh, means like, um, yeah, be, it comes from behold, it comes from see. Thea means see. So theater or theory also, they are, come, uh, they are uh, connected to the concept of seeing. This means for theater you need the audience. But for performance, you don't, you don't need the audience. Uh, performance uh, etymologically means like uh, par, like perfection, complete. Uh, completion and follow. And the furnier, I, think, I guess, is furnish, provide. So it's, it's about providing something perfectly. It's about delivering uh, something uh, thoroughly, meaning delivering the, what is planned as planned. <laughs> Am I making sense? So, so performance is something about you do an action you, you thought you would do and you're into it, you don't need an audience. So um, when you go to some performance event, you see some performers doing something and normally they don't care about you, <laughs> they just do <laughs> their own job. So and conceptual art has a very, very similar aspect in which the artists, they just do an action without anyone looking at them just performing, just uh, perfectly delivering the action. Um, so this connection between um, performance, performance and conceptual art is important for me. And for, uh, because my uh, PhD research is also about this. Um, the research, my research is uh, about me uh, using my body as the only medium, the only medium to play out this idea. Um, I will not write any dissertation, uh, not uh, thesis, but perform. Um, it's a four-year performance, actually, but maybe I will, I, today I cannot talk about it well. Um, but as I just wanted to say, because in conceptual art, uh, Historically, um, conventionally, most of them are male artists. Uh, male, let's, well, and uh, American or European artists. But uh, there are, of course, female artists or non-Western, let's say, let's say non-Western artists, they, who were also doing similar things, like, um, like devoting themselves to the, to the predetermined actions. 
So uh, by kind of connecting performance and conceptual art, I could uh, de re let's say <laughs> um, revise the, the division of conceptual art. Not now it's like the solid type and the Joseph Kosu's type two modes of concept conceptual art as kind of together considered as conceptual art. But I I want to divide them. I don't like. Joseph Kosus, I want to kick him out. And I just, uh, you know, with solid and uh, performance art, especially in the 60s, there were some performances where the performers were just following the task, tasks, predetermined tasks. It's like a game. And also for which uh, Yvonne Reyna said, uh, uh, I forgot how old like, real was, but the performer needs to be just a, just a human body, uh, just a normal person, stuff like that. So by, this, by doing this, I could, it's not purpose, but I could also um, include other female and non-Western artists, like uh, Yvonne Lehner, as I just mentioned. Or the, this artist I really like recent, um, I found her recently, and she's really great, called Rosemary Castoro. She was like literally doing performance and then became more conceptual and like her work shifted a lot, but uh, it's really, really interesting. So, yeah. Um, hmm. Right, and thinking this way, if you think a work of conceptual art as a performance, um, you can say the result is a documentation. Like, you know, it's a painting, the uh, photography, and let's say sculpture. But uh, they are not, they're not painting, they're not a sculpture photography. They're more like a documentation of the performance. If the, if, the, if the performance itself is a work, and this is a documentation, because it kind of documents all your, act all, all your actions. It re reflects, it traces you, your action. And uh, so what is documented? Well, why, why documentation? Um, because for Solvit, uh, you, fix rules, you set rules, then you don't know what happens, actually. So you need to doc document what happens. Uh, things happen uh, unexpectedly. And he, in his own words, it's, this is actually just a draft of uh, sentences of conceptual art by Solowit. He didn't, okay, I, he, here he says, the value of the work of conceptual art is in its unpredictability. Um, I kind of, I wonder why, but he didn't leave this in the final version of this text. He uh, deleted it. I don't know why, but 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 in many interviews, he keeps saying like he likes to see things that you know happened un unexpectedly, and he. Kind of, yeah. He he sets rules uh, for for this. So this is also a big difference between Solowit and Co Joseph Kosuz. Um, uh, yeah, I and put together how they are different. Um, so Solwit, for him, conceptual art is art of conception, art in which you uh, preserve what is conceived as is. You try to just trust it to the completion, to the conclusion. But for Joseph Kosuth, it's art of concept. I mean, conceptual is an adjective of what? Normally, people think it's concept and conceptual. You know, you 
the adjective of concept is conceptual. But you can also say conceptual is an adjective of conception. Some dictionar dictionaries also say this. And for idea, uh, for Solit, it's a plan to do certain actions. For Joseph Kosuth, it's intention or meaning. And, uh, and yeah, the, uh, on, the, on every stage of the chart, there's difference, contrast. But perhaps the most important difference is that uh, mm, yeah, in, when you realize the action uh, for solid results are unpredicted. So it kind of embraces chance. But for Joseph Kosuth, results are all foreseen because for him, he doesn't only uh, think, uh, he doesn't only determine rules, but he only determines all the all the actions. How to say? For solid, it's just a rules, and like a, like a rules for suck for football, there are rules, and but you don't know what happens. But for Joseph Kosuth, he defines every player, how to where, and you know how you shoot and stuff like that. Everything, everything is planned in the beginning. So for him, uh, the results are foreseen, and so chance is excluded. Um, I mean, I tried to explain unpredictability of conceptual art. So it's open. Basically, conceptual art is, should be something that is open-ended. Um, and the result, the documentation reflects. What does it reflect? I think, I think it is the how miraculous the, the world is, let's say. Because things happen uh, beyond your expectation, beyond your, um, how to say, your vision. Um, in the world, Everything happens as a miracle. Everything happens just one time. Everything, <laughs> also today, <laughs> this every moment is a miracle, I think. Um, but, and conceptual art is an attempt to kind of uh, um, crystallize this miraculousness through frames, through, uh, by putting rules. Uh, through the rules, you frame it. What I mean, <laughs> what do I mean, is that um, mm, you know, uh, Hubra went to each location of the hexagon, and he took photos. Um, but you don't know what would be there. <laughs> he didn't know uh, about the street, what kind of shops, or what kind of people would be walking, and the weather, and everything. So these photos just uh, show uh, the, how to say, chance, Accident accidentalness. And also the, I mean, so Lawrence Wiener, he, carved the wall to make a square, but he didn't know uh, exactly about how, uh, how to say, how it would be sculpted, the each um, ups and downs, concaves. Um, he couldn't control it because it was uh, like kind of rough action. So this also, I think, shows the world, how the world works. And for Onkawara also, I mean, of course the paints also, I mean, he tries to be like a machine. He tries to do it precisely. Um, but, uh, how to say, but paint itself has uh, its own materiality, so it, it behaves as it is. And more clearly, uh, this newspaper, I mean, each painting of uh, today's series uh, is accompanied by that day's newspaper. And this is totally uh, beyond your control. <laughs> you can't control what happens, what would be on the newspaper. 
And so Sol Ruit was conscious about this aspect, this unpredictability of the world um, as, as an object of his uh, idea of conceptual art. And conceptual art uh, is to document the unpredictability of the world. He knew it. But he didn't know the other aspect, the, um, the other side of the same coin, I think, which is, um, I would say, um, the true personality of the artist. <laughs> um, like, as I said, you, you, de you depersonalize yourself in the process of doing those actions um, because it doesn't require anything special. You just, um, you are just a clerk doing things that you're supposed to do. Um, but precisely because of this, I think each result of the action reflects who you are. <laughs> like in his photo, maybe let's say it, if it reflects the artist's height, how high he was, how tall he was, and maybe the angle or his uh, idiosyncratic way of taking photo. Um, also, like his, his arbitrary selection of the date and the time and the order of the locations. And this one also, uh, the result reflects how he did it, his actions, his own way of doing it. I mean, he, the, how to say, the, the way you do it, you can't re really control um, because it's just, the way your body works. And uh, for his work as well, um, like, yeah, the more you try to be like a machine, the more uh, you get your, you, the more it reveals your own um, idiosyncrasy of painting. So it's about self. Um, it's about something, an aspect of your body that you don't even know. Like a particular kind of self-portrait. So, I think this, like, so for me, the conceptual art, a work of conceptual art reveals the uh, true reality of the world and the true personality of the artist at the same time. Um, are they two different things? Or maybe, as I said, they're two different sides of the same coin. Because um, the world, what is the world? How can you define the world? Um, I think the world is something that is external to you, that is uh, something you can't control, you can't hold control of. So, and, uh, the, the, who you are, the, the, you know, how to say, the, who you are as a body is also something beyond your control, beyond your vision, um, because your body is part of the world. So it's about the worldness of your body. I'm trying to say it's the same thing. It's two aspects of the same thing. So conceptual art is this kind of like uh, strange particular methodology. And now, finally, we can move to the philosophy of the Japanese philosopher. Uh, because uh, through his ideas, we can, uh, we can get another angle to, to, yeah, to look at conceptual art. Do we need a break, maybe? No? Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Um, but if you want to go to the toilet, please. Um, to, to, to. So finally, 
I can introduce Kitaro Nishida to you. A uh, Japanese philosopher uh, died in 1945, so he's old. I mean, the previous, previous generation. I mean, yeah, okay, anyway. Um, and I'm not a philosopher. I'm not specialized in philosophy. So please forgive me for, um, I mean, my ex explanation today is we will not be so precise and it's not so, um, I'm not expert. But I'm trying to use his philosophy as a tool, as a guide uh, to, yeah, to explore conceptual art. But, but by the way, his text is super, super complicated and redundant. Like, like it's just not logical and it doesn't make sense. And so a lot of people have having difficulty to interpret what he's saying. But you basically need someone to analyze and interpret what he says. So I'm not only referring to his own words, but also I, li I will refer to um, those interpretations, uh, analysis by other people. Anyway, I will talk about two levels, two levels. One is um, psych psychical, um, Ah, I see. Oh yeah, I didn't show this. Conceptual art is simultaneous manifestation of the true reality of the world and the true personality of the artist. How do you define true is a problem, but maybe um, I hope to articulate it through Kitaro Nishida. Oh, okay. So I will talk about two levels. One, psychical mental, conscious, abstract, primitive, and also physical, material, corporeal, concrete, everyday. Uh, and now please forget about conceptual art. Now we can focus on his ideas. And first I will talk about psychical level, uh, conscious level. Normally people think, uh, you think, there's the world, and you are in it, like this, I, I. So me and other person, we are uh, equal in the world surrounding us. However, uh, in, on this level, on this uh, psychical level, according to Nishida, it's not like that. Uh, the world itself is me. So this is me and the world, and other persons are in it, but they are totally different from me. And so, and well, here, this is me and that there are a world outside you, external world, but in here, there, there's nothing external. Everything is internal. Everything is you. What? Um, yeah, so, and there's no distinction between self and other, no distinction between subject and object. What do I mean? <laughs> can you, <laughs> I don't know, can you close your eyes? I, uh, you don't have to, but uh, yeah, please close your eyes. And if you want, uh, maybe now you're, you're hearing my voice, right? You're hearing my voice, and this is your experience. Okay, you can open your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so whose experience is this? is this? This is your experience normally, you say. However, uh, on this uh, primitive, primitive level, it's no one's, nobody's. The experience is, belongs to nobody. It doesn't belong to you, to, to anyone. Because uh, it is only I, I, who could experience things. Um, so you don't have to say I, because you are the only subject, not subject, but you are the only <laughs> thing that, experience, that is experiencing things. The world is you, the world is me, sorry. Um, uh, 
uh, simply speaking, when you die, the world ends. So this is the uh, evidence of why or how the world is you. And before you were born, there was no world. Or maybe you can try to forget about uh, knowledge. Forget about what you, what you know, but only focus on uh, what you experience. Or you can go back to when you were a baby, newborn baby. You didn't know the language. You didn't know that there are external worlds, and you didn't know you were perceiving something from outside, and you, your body is actually filtering it. You didn't know that. You only had an intuition, and you were grasp grasping things directly without language as a mediation. So Nishida calls this pure experience. It's pre-reflective, you know, before you reflect things. It's just, you're hearing a voice. <laughs> Um, a pure experience is the same as a direct experience. It is the transient moment when you see a color or hear a sound and you haven't yet realized that you are perceiving something that is external to you, even before making any judgment as to what the color is or the sound is. That's what he says. Um, so to verbalize the, the experience of hearing my voice, um, on this level, it would be, if you really want to verbalize it, it would be like, a voice is being audible. Just that, a voice is being audible. So, um, it's not, I mean, it's not a voice is being audible for me. Uh, if you say for me, it means like, uh, it differentiates subject and object. Because you, you say, for me, because you know, it means that you think other people also can hear the voice. Without knowing this, you don't have to say, for me, because it is only you who hearing the voice. And you don't, even, you don't have to say, a voice is being audible for me, but it's not audible for you. Oh, I'm saying the same thing, I feel. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, I want to say like, Oh, a voice is being audible for me, uh, is that in this sentence, the voice is the object, and me is the subject, right? Uh, not as a sentence, but as a meaning. And you don't have to, s hmm, because the, the how to say, the, the experience, experience itself is a one entire thing. There's no voice, there's no me, but the voice is audible. This is the one situation. I, I'm not good at explaining, I think. Um, so on this level, at, on this stage, at this stage, uh, I am not an object. I am a place, Nishida says. Uh, I is not a subject, but a place, a place of absolute nothingness. Uh, normally, it is thought that I is a subject, uh, I is a subjective unity, but I must be a pre predicative unity. It must be a circle, not a point. It must, a it must be a place, not an object. What does he mean? Um, subject, object, predicate. So predicate is, actually predicate is the part that describes the experience. Um, Nishida says, this is where I is. And those different experiences are overlapped uh, in a superposition, in the state of superposition in this place called, it's not called, but this place of nothingness. Um, Hmm. A place of absolute, absolute nothingness is like a circle without surroundings wherein each and every spot can serve as the center. Um, so, 
So he says, I is a place of nothingness. Why a place of nothingness? Why is it nothingness? Because he says, um, it's nothing. It's not a void. It's not empty void, but it's just nothing. And when an experience arises, it kind of, it becomes as big as experience. It's not objectified. It's just, um, um, it's zero when there's no experience, but when there's an experience, it expands as big as the experience itself. Um, how can I explain this? So he says, uh, I is a place of absolute nothingness, which is the fun fundamental background. It's a background, so you can't objectify it. Yeah, maybe, yeah, I think it's okay, I guess. Um, so wha what? Uh, so if you are, if I am a place of nothingness, um, what would subjectivize or individuate me? Uh, he says it's, it's an absolute other, another place of nothingness, self-negation. This is needed uh, for me to, be, to become a subject, to become an individual. So absolute other is something, uh, it's not me, but another thing that is experiencing something, that can experience things. It's the other, we are on the same level. It's, so this absolute other is not other, pe other persons, but someone like you who is experiencing something. Mm. You are the world, you are the world, I am the world, so uh, there were no such, such entities that are like me. Now you have another entity like you, and this, this being uh, negates you because you are the world, but now this, this, uh, this being says, oh, you are not the world, we are the same. We are experiencing this together. So this is a self-negation. Um, let's say, like you are a baby, you are a baby, and you knew there are other babies or other adults, but you didn't know. They all experience things like me. Um, you didn't know they were all, each of them was nothingness, actually. Each of, the, each of them uh, em, um, like embrace the world itself. They look like individual, individuated, separated, but um, each of them actually expands to the entire world. You didn't know this. And you got to know this, you get to know this through an absolute other, which is do, so, which is you, but uh, Nishida uses this as, like, uh, as a you know, classical, I think, term for you. So it is you. Um, maybe, yeah, okay. Do, so <laughs> do uh, emerges, and you encounter do, and you realize, oh, I am nothing and you are nothing. However, you are also an individual in here, in the surroundings. This means, oh, I, I may be also an individual in your world. Do I look individual for you? Um, so it's like you objectify yourself, you know, you relat relativize yourself. Before that, you are everything, but now, oh, you are relative. You are absolute, but now you are relative. Oh yeah, this is kind of, um, this actually shows uh, what I just described, what I just tried to explain. 
It's complicated, so I think I will skip it. So he says, I comes into being by being killed. You are killed by meeting Tho. You are negated. Um, so how to say? Um, by by being killed as a place, as a as a place of nothingness, as the world, you are killed, and then uh, you become you. Finally, now you need to say I. <laughs> Before that, you didn't have to say I, but now you need to say I. So this is the birth of language. Um, before that, you are hearing the voice, you are feeling hungry, you are feeling cold, and it was only you, but now, Do can also experience it. And now you need to say I, because otherwise, uh, you don't know who are experiencing it. So Do um, gives birth to I, and because of meeting Do, um, you are differentiated into uh, self and other. I mean, yeah, self and other are differentiated now. So this happened at the same time, all at the same time. And in this sense, uh, Japanese language is very primitive. How should I explain? Actually, in Japanese, we don't say I, we don't say you. Uh, also, we don't use personal pronouns so much. Um, we all read it by context. I mean, when, when we write, you, you use I, you, he, but when you speak to people, you just say hungry, meaning I'm hungry. And you know it, it's you who, who is hungry because it is you who says that. Or you say love. This means I love you. In Japanese, if 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 uh, if I translate it literally, you just say love, and you know, oh, you love me, because it is you who said that, and it, you said it to me, so it means you love me. And when we hear the vo hear a voice, we say, "koe ga kikoeru," literally meaning a voice is being audible. Here, oh, I I want I prefer audible, so a voice is being audible. Um, this is how we describe it in Japanese. Although in, in English, maybe you, it's, it is more natural to say, I can hear a voice, or I'm hearing a voice. But in Japanese, you don't have to say, I, uh, you just say, a voice is being audible. Um, but in Japanese, when you really need to distinguish, it is you, you say it after that. So a voice is being audible for me. <laughs> um, because, yeah, I don't know, like in, 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 the, in situations where you really need to say that and otherwise people don't know who's hearing the voice, then you finally need to say it. So this uh, almost kind of repeats, reproduces the, the process of um, self-negation. So for me, this, so where, I mean, okay, for me, right? at the end of the sentence. And um, about this, a uh, Japanese philosopher called Hitoshi, Hitoshi Nagai says, in the Japanese grammar, I is not a nominative or accusative case, but a dative case. Um, nominative case is basically a subject. It's about subject. This is nominative. Subject is nominative. And accusative is the direct object. The dog ate our turkey. So this is an uh, accusative case. And what is, uh, what is dative case? It's an uh, indirect object. Uh, we gave a bone to our dog. So this is the direct object, uh, which is accusative case. And our dog is dative case, uh, which is indirect object. Uh, so indirect object is the destination of the action. Destination is a place. So now you know. I'm a place. 
So uh, Japanese language, uh, its grammar, I think, really reflects this. And uh, so this differentiation into self and other, uh, Nishida calls it self-awareness. What does it mean? It means that uh, you are aware that you are nothing. You are a place, you are the world, but at the same time, you are an individual for other people. These two contradictory, two contradictory facts you are aware of this, and you are aware of self. <laughs> That's what he means by this term, self-awareness. So you are a place, but you are an uh, individual as well. And you can say this is, you can say it's a dialectic in a way, um, or superposition of two different, two oppo opposed um, yeah, conditions. So by the way, what is, what is self? According to Google, self uh, is a person's essential being that distinguishes them from others, especially considered as the object. I think I like it. I like this one because of this considered as object. So I think self is an objectified version of you. Uh, mm, yeah. So self portrait is, let's say, uh, a self portrait is a painting that portrays you as an object, right? So like self is uh, something, yeah, you being objectified through the mirror when when it comes to self-portrait, but also through different uh, apparatuses and tools. So this way, um, you become an individual. And now you know, oh, this is me, <laughs> this is me. So the physical contour of your body, now it is uh, equal to who you think you are. Before, you were everywhere, but now you're, you're conversed to your body. Now you are embodied. Now you became a human, person. What is a person? Person is a human being uh, regarded as an individual. <laughs> so if you become an individual and if you're human, then you are a person. Finally. <laughs> and this also means, uh, I think, uh, that... Uh, mm, mm, okay. In a way, uh, your subjective reality is also uh, uh, now in line with the objective reality. Maybe I'm saying the same thing, yeah? Before it was the world, but now it's your body. And also this, this, this uh, self-awareness enables uh, society. Without this, you know, society cannot be possible. And uh, 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 I think that this is a process of a baby growing into an adult, but also uh, this is a process we, we repeat every day, at every moment, very, very quickly. Like, it's, I think, you know, uh, every moment you experience something, uh, maybe it's a very, very, very short moment, uh, you are nothing, then you self-aware, self-aware aware yourself. So this process is, um, yeah, it's a repetition all the time. And Nishida calls it also self-determination of absolute nothingness. What does he mean by this is that this process of differentiation is embedded in the place of absolute nothingness. Uh, it's self-developed um, 
I, I don't know why, actually. But like meeting though is also a part of, part of the place. It's all, all, and it's a program. It's a self, oh, so you don't have to do anything, but it's like, it's like this world, it's like the, there was a big bang and then now we have uh, living organisms. This is maybe a self-development de self of the world. And similarly, he thinks this differentiation is kind of automatic. And this automatis, automaticity he calls self-determination. Okay. Now you have embodied, you are embodied. You are a person. So let's move on to the physical level. Um, yeah, okay. Real world. Hmm. So on the physical level, the background is now it's not the place of nothingness, but the back background now is real world. It's the real world. And it's a world where, uh, it's a domain where uh, different individuals coexist and interact with each other. And also uh, each individual interacting with the environment. And this uh, chaotic network of physical beings is the real world for him. And humans are part of this. So, yeah, so, well, I mean, I've been talking about the psychical level, and now I'm trying to talk about physical level. And on this primitive level, uh, the unitary actuality was place of absolute nothingness, but now it's real world. And on this level, agent of self-negation was do, so, you, another place of absolute nothingness. And in, on the physical level, it is human action, producing an actional intuition. This is his term. Um, am I making sense? So the, now the uh, agent of self-negation is not though, but human actions. And the form of self-determination self is not self-awareness, but now it's absolute contradictory self-identification, renewals of the world. What? am I saying? What does he mean? Um, for Nishida, uh, action is to act and to produce, to mirror the world. Um, why? Um, for him, an action is an act of mirroring the world. He also calls it expression. It's an expression. And why mirroring? Because for him, the world is an interaction between uh, subjects and objects, subjectivity and objectivity. Uh, uh, their negotiation, relentless, uh, never ending interaction is the world. And when you produce something, when you make an artwork, when you make a sculpture, it is also uh, the process, the action, the action of making it is a negotiation between subjectivity and objectivity. Negotiation between your body and the environment and the material. That's why it mirrors the world because both, both the produced work, uh, the producing, producing action and the world are uh, interaction between subjectivity and objectivity. What does he mean by, by interaction is like uh, we make objects and objects make us. Um, I don't know. When you make a sculpture and this sculpture inspires you to make another thing, stuff like that, but not uh, not just uh, about the complete, completed work, but also in the process of, uh, because you know he's not, he didn't know conceptual art. What, what, what's in his, what is in, what is in his mind is more like a traditional work, like painting, sculpture, where the artist needs to uh, interact with the material.
And he says every action has this kind of creativity, uh, pro 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 productiveness, let's say, um, or interactiveness. But uh, to, um, to illuminate this aspect, he coined a term, actional intuition. It's about uh, intuiting by acting and acting by intuiting. Mm. They are inter intertwined, intertwined. Uh, they are inseparable. Like you act and you get feedback and you act and you get, yeah, action, reaction, action, reaction. Yeah, this is, uh, so to, to, to illuminate, illuminate this aspect, yeah, he called it actional intuition. And he said, actional intuition must be the most radical and concrete way for us to comprehend the real in a conscious way. Instinct can be seen as an undeveloped state of actional intuition, and art can be thought of as the utmost limit of one of its directions. Uh, he means art is the mm, highest state of actional intuition. Producing works of art. Uh, in terms of uh, artistic intuition, to act is to see, and to see, to see is to act. Hmm. And a work of art is not the artist's subjectivity. The artist must become objective, objective by losing their self. That is where what is called inspiration or ecstasy lies. Um, if, you intentionally, if you intentionally try to create a certain thing, it will never come true. If you intentionally try to paint a certain painting, it will never become a real painting. Hmm. And humans are bodily existences, and simultaneously, human bodies must be instru instruments. Um, I mean, this is, I think, a really traditional idea, I guess, but I, I also kind of believe it. Like, like, you forget yourself, you avoid your subjectivity, and you kind of try to become one with the world. Um, then, uh, only by doing this, you can get a nice artwork. If you are too conscious, you, if you are too intentional, um, then maybe the work would become just an illustration of your intention, just like Joseph Kosuth, for me. But, um, but for, for uh, yeah, Nishida says it's more like you need to lose your intention. You need to just follow your body and your in kind of instinctive relations with the materiality. And this also means uh, you uh, offer your body as an instrument for, for the world to use. So the world uses your body as an instrument to make actions, because the world needs human actions. Oh, OK. Uh, but let me now. Uh, Explain. So, if the art, if art is one of the utmost limits of actional intuition, there are actions that are the least actional intuitional for him. Um, one is like uh, animal movements. Uh, it's instinctive, mechanical, purposeful. Mechanical. Why mechanical? Because he thinks that the animal doesn't create things for him. Well, I mean, I don't know if I follow him, but. I don't know if I support him, but simply speaking, animals don't create things. They only follow the nature, and you, they act for them to live in this nature. That's what he means by uh, mechanical, and also purposeful. And for animal beings, seeing works very hazily. They see only the shadows of objects, like a dream. Their movements must be regarded as instinctive. For them, that which has been produced never departs from the producer. So anyway, for him, uh, yeah, animals are just instinctive, only objective. 
so their actions are not quite actions, not quite uh, action or intuitional. And on the other hand, humans, when they are really intellectual, really intentional, or I would say cerebrum oriented, um, when you are very rational, subjective, your actions are not, not quite action or intuitional. Um, in his own words, creating objects is not just having oneself seized by objects, not just having oneself make effects highly consciously either. So by this, yes, again, I think about Joseph Kossuth. <laughs> um, so what emerges, what arises by actional intuitions? He calls it uh, absolute contradictory self-identification as a form of uh, the self-negation of the world because um, the world uses human actions to self-negate itself. The world needs human actions to negate what, what, they, what it is. Um, because human actions and the result of their actions are uh, the, um, how to say, a reflection of the world. It's another world because it's, uh, it's amalgam of subjectivity and objectivity. So the world, so that's the, the other for the world just like do for you, the, the do for I. So the world needs it to negate itself, to revise itself, to become a new state. That's what, what his discussion. Mm, I think it's just that we humans create something that didn't exist before. Uh, so this is a destruction, a negation for the world but once it's made, the world incorporates it into itself quickly. So the world now has revised itself, including this one. That's what he means. Um, so that, so for him, I said revi revision, but he said it's a new world. A new world is born each time there's an action. And that a new world is created does not just mean that the past world is negated or disappears. What happens is a separation in the sense of dialectic. Hmm. The world, human action, negating each other, but now it, the world takes it in itself and goes up as a revised version of it. So, yeah, absolute contradictory self-identification is ceaseless renewals of the historical world. Oh yeah, he said historical world, yeah. This means also this is uh, because uh, the world has a history, a chronology of revisions, history of revisions. So the world is built as a history. And I'm finishing very soon. Um, so how, then uh, what it would be like if you take a look at this from the perspective of uh, the actor, a human actor. Um, because the actor revi uh, revises the environment but at the same time, that, that the environment revises the actor. It revises who you are. Because, uh, yeah, mm, you make something, and this thing you made, you have made, inspires you. Um, or, I don't know, you act to the world, and the world reacts to you, and you, 
you get some information from the world. <laughs> That's what he means by intuition. Like, uh, also, like Solowit, you know, you, you conceive an idea as an intuition. It's like you just catches it from the air. Um, what emerges from your brush as you paint while forgetting who you are completely is the true self, Nishida says. Again, he's, he refers to art here. Yeah, here, uh, he, he has said the artist must become object objective by losing their self. So he says, um, you need to forget who you are um, so that your action gets highly actional intuitional and then it reveals who it revises and then reveals who you are right now mm. and this true self uh, in, uh, according to him he also calls it a bodily self so it's the self of your body not self of your mind, but you as a holistic being, and, and it has its own characteristics. That's what he means by bodily self, uh, true self, actional self, true personality. Or in other words, it's the, the, the worldness of your body. Um, yeah. So, when the world revises itself through human actions, you, uh, you also revise yourself through the same action. Because when renewal of the world happens, renewal of oneself also happens. Because you are part of the world. Um, so absolutely contradictory self-identification is initially it's about the world revising itself, but it also, uh, at the same time, um, um, like uh, yeah, makes it happen. Like makes a uh, revival of the actor's personality <laughs> happen at the same time. They are like twin, twin effects. Not because they are identical, but because they happen at the same time. They are born at the same time. So this twin effect of human action, I think this is just um, conceptual art itself. <laughs> that what, uh, what I wanted to explain through presenting the initial definition of conceptual art by Solowit is uh, re-articulated here through his philosophy, I think. But, uh, you know, as I said, he was only, I mean, Nishida was only thinking about traditional art. He didn't, he didn't know conceptual art. Um, but then why or how uh, those two different, almost opposed uh, modes of artistic production traditional art, conceptual art, why do they have the same, do they reach, do they arrive at the same effect? Um, so tra traditional art versus conceptual art. Commonalities, what are uh, common in both of them, I think. Uh, like the world uses the artist's body as an instrument to, to take actions. And not intention, but intuition matters. Uh, subjectivity, rationality is avoided during the action and the action renews words true reality and the artist's true personality, bodily self, at once. The double renewal is documented by the resultant, resultant object. I think these are common in both conceptual art and traditional art. And what, what the differences are, um, like exercising one's sensibility and skills freely 
in traditional art versus following the preset rules mechanically in conceptual art. This is a very, very big, big difference. And so this also means in traditional art, the artist was somebody special, or the, act, the executant was somebody special. But in conceptual art, it's anybody able-bodied. And uh, in traditional art, each work was one-time improvisation. You, it's a result of your negotiation with the materials. And you can't repeat it. Uh, when, especially when it's a nice work, nice painting, maybe you know this. Um, in contrast, in conceptual art, the action can be repeated be because it's a set of instructions. You just follow it and you just carry it out. Then you, uh, you can do the action. It's, li it, it's repeatable. And automatically, as a result of the action, uh, the world is renewed and the executant self is also renewed. Therefore, any work of conceptual art is a program under which anybody is able to perform the utmost limit of actional intuition. This is my conclusion. Yeah, you don't have to be a genius uh, for conceptual art. It's a program, and you just follow it, and you reach at the same result as a genius artist in traditional art. So this is my conclusion. However, I am also trying to look further, <laughs> look beyond this scope. And as I said in the beginning, I am inspired by translation or inspired by the subjectivity of a translator. I, um, I explore, explore a form of self-portrait, new form of self-portraiture, let's say, through other artists or as a bodily self. But also I explore uh, a new form of individuality, as I said, not, def not defined by bodily separation, but defined by uh, overlaps across different personalities. Meaning a way to go beyond the self-other distinction. In a way, it is a, a attempt to uh, go back to the primitive level according to Nishida. And I think this also is part of conceptual art. So here I'm asking, is conceptual art oriented toward the primitive self other unity through one's embodiment of an, any body? So I think this is a question I want to play out through my uh, PhD research. Um, Oh yeah, well, uh, concretely speaking, it's just very, very simple, actually. When you see like this photo, you feel, oh, you can do it, I can do it. I can put myself in the shoes of the artist. I can be, I could be there, could have been, could have been there. I just, I could have whole held my phone and took this photo. Um, so I want to act, uh, activate this potentiality as I said, like, uh, you know, normally, uh, in principle, each work of concept, conceptual art was um, like, uh, possible to be carried out by anybody, but actually nobody did it, almost. But now I want to do it. I want to reenact, or I want to make my own version of uh, so-called conceptual processes. And through this, I want to uh, um, yeah, uh, prove that it, um, the, all the things I've been talking today, I want to prove all, all this through my performance, through my re-performance for four years. That's my research. And, oh yeah, so this is a title of my research. Uh, anybody, myself, conceptual art and personhood. Not anybody, but anybody. I try to 
embody anybodyness, and then maybe my own self, the true form, real form of my own self would be revealed through my re-performance of conceptual art. And it's also about personhood. Personhood, I think, is a term about the state, uh, the fact, factual state of being a person. It's not personality. Personality is a quality of you as a person, uh, both consciously and corporeally, corpor in a corporeal sense. But personhood is just a minimal status of being a person. And I believe uh, conceptual art is a very, very interesting um, um, uh, yeah, um, yeah, endeavor for this. Okay. Yes. Yes, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, it's been two hours. Thank you so much. <laughs> we finish or maybe like... Yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, Personally, I love conceptual art very much, and I'm um, inspired by how you try to bring conceptual art from its historical documentary position into the now, mm -hmm. em embodying it by new artistic practice. I think it's very um, radical and daring to do. But still, uh, I have a question. Uh, if you consider a conceptual art as a kind of performative art uh, for which the artist becomes like a machine and anybody could do it basically. Why then did you not consider um, fluxus events right. as also a possible alternative? Because you know about fluxus and the little event cards by George Brecht, uh, little, little scripts and scores to be performed by anybody, even more simple than conceptual stuff mm -hmm, mm -hmm. quite often, and also in time even coming before conceptual art. So why did you select conceptual art and not like uh, fluxus art of the late 50s, early early 1960s. Okay. Um, yeah, I think... Um, I remember when I studied Fluxus, it was... My impression was that it, it was more about... It was a lot about imagination. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> but uh, like Yoko Ono, I mean, she's Japanese, I, I li relate myself to her, but... It's like you... Uh, I mean... The, uh, often, there, the instructions of Fluxus include uh, instructions for you to imagine something, no? or maybe not. Like, like you, what do you think? Partly, Partly yeah. Um, so if so, if so, um, because for me, uh, one characteristic, characteristic of concept, conceptual art is that it's all about things that could take place physically, it's not about possibility. I mean, it's not about uh, things that cannot happen in reality. It's about how this real world reacts to your stimulation. And somehow, Fluxus, maybe uh, I need to study it again, study it again. <laughs> but I, I feel it's more imaginative and also more, how to say? eventful as well, like, I mean, they do things in front of people, or oh, well, they didn't, or <laughs> they, um, as an event, as a, yeah, I think I, I took a note, like, why I don't consider fluxus, but I need to look at it again. <laughs> yeah, m maybe but, you're right in that, um, I can follow you, that Fluxus is more about performing before an audience, like yeah. Yeah, they, yeah. they called it Fluxus Concerts, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. really, like Yoko Ono did like concerts, yeah. enjoyed direct, whereas conceptual art almost did like in a hidden way or something, yeah, without yeah. people indeed uh, being involved and watching. That indeed could be the main difference. Yeah. In that case, I, I can follow yeah, your yes. decision, basically. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Interesting. Thank you.
but I'm, I'm sure they are related and conceptual at Fluxus. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Someone else? Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you very much.